few more minutes, uh, just in case uh, uh, anybody else shows up. While, w- yeah, while we're waiting, yeah, guys, while we're waiting, when we get to the, um, the sections on, on uh, Corinthians, chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians, we're going to go through table by table. So that means take the next five, or five minutes or so, grab... Uh, chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians, and as a table, I want to know what you guys see, what you found. You should have read it enough times to have noticed a few things based on the conversation we had last week. You should be able to see a few things in there, so we're going to be kind of going through what do you see, what are the questions that, we're going to, that we need to be looking at, and then we'll kind of go from there, okay? Um, yep, so I'm going to give you a few minutes while we're waiting for anybody else to, to show up, and then, uh, and then we'll start. All right, so, yep. so we're going to get started for tonight, and uh, as we're going through during the break especially, you might want to revisit that particular section of text, and we'll take a, take a look at what we're doing in the uh, second half. Okay, so first up, let's just do a quick review of what we talked about last week so we can kind of get a primer back to where we are. Um, A few things that we looked at last week is the process of hermeneutics, right? Let me make sure, yep. So who can define hermeneutics for me? I mean, granted, we wrote it down like 12 times. (laughs) Yeah. Basically, yes, yeah. Applying a timeless truth to a modern day. So the process that we use in order to get to that timeless truth and its proper application is called what? First step. Great. Who can define exegesis for me? Yes. Yes. Keep going, though, because you're missing a, uh, there's a piece missing. Uh, no, what you said was critical interpretation of the original text, Right. There's, uh, the answer is like, it, like jammed in there. Uh, it just needs a slightly different wording. Original intent of the author? There you go. Yes, yes. Finding the original intent uh, of the author. Now, is the original intent of the author just in the words, or are there other things that we have to look at? Um, uh, how, do you, how do we go about finding that original intent? Uh, yep, exactly. So there's some things that we talked about. We talked about dealing with language, right? So what's the language barrier? You're not allowed to answer anymore. <laughs> so what, in terms of our, of our hermeneutic or our exegesis, what, what role does language play in that? Okay. Understanding what the original language was is the first part, right? Yeah. Um, so what's the barrier? Exactly. And largely, we're dealing with dead languages. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with, with thing, things that are highly interpretive. Um, so they could go in a lot of different directions. Okay, so what about history? How does history affect our exegesis? Times change. So. Mm-hmm. Living in the West. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Things aren't the same today as they were back then, were they? Uh, and boy, whoo, after some of the reading I did today, <laughs> Um, good thing. Uh, okay, so what about, uh, we're talking about issues of the day. So what about society? <laughs> societal issues. Now, societal issues are in the same area as historical issues, but it's not quite the same. Yeah. Money, currency, measurements. hmm Yep, things we would consider societal norms. Um, you know, not, you know, like mm-hmm. norm from Cheers is the first thing that kind of came to my mind. <laughs> but uh, actually, you know what? I need to turn my phone off as well. Um, there. 
Phone in airplane mode, done. Um, yeah, so uh, acceptable norms, cultural particularities. You know, like we said, not too, many people you, not too many of you run down to the store and buy a home or a flower, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, and then there's that other weird, uh, weird term uh, that talking about change, historical distance. Historical distance. What are we talking about when we're dealing with historical distance in terms of hermeneutics? Actually, can someone close that, that, that door right there? Because they're going to be in and out a little bit. So historical distance. Uh, no, it, um, uh, you're kind of in the, the right way, but instead of like physical distance, we're talking more about time. I mean, the farther away we get from the actual then the witnesses and the, the, what's written, and mm-hmm. it just gets harder to find yeah. the original document. Yeah. Uh, original documents, but also more to the point, original application. So historical distance has a lot more to do with how we apply what we know today versus how they did it back then. You know, uh, here's, a, here's a great example um, today, women's work. When we think women's work today, what would you naturally roll into that? I'm talking like 50s wives, that, that, that kind of thing. You know, <laughs> Yeah, really. But you're talking about like laundry, you know, doing the dishes, taking care of the house and stuff like that. Okay, so women's work, yeah, women's work in the first century, yeah, women's work in the first century may have been skinning a carcass, stretching leather, making a garment for their kids out of, you know, uh, cotton that they weaved into fabric, it, historical distance. There, it's, it's a slightly different, you know, you can't just go down to Joanne Fabrics in the middle of Jerusalem and pick up a bolt of, you know, a bolt of fabric and make something. It just doesn't work that way. Um, not to mention things like if you wanted to sew something, you had to either buy or make thread. Mm-hmm. Then you either had to buy or make the needle. It's, it's, just, it's just a different, it's a slightly different world, isn't it? A whole new... Anyway, um, so... <laughs> so now also, we also have issues dealing with the text itself. We've got context. Um, Sean uh, touched on that just a second ago talking about historical and literary context. So when we're dealing with the, the historical context of the text, what are we talking about? Historical, or do you mean? The historical context of the text. Uh, proper application, literary influences. Mm-hmm. Basically, most of what we just talked about. Yeah, all of that plays into the historical context. What about the literary context? Exactly. Yeah. Remember, words are great, but words only make sense in sentences, in paragraphs, as they're applied to things. They're, they're conveyed for a specific purpose. It's not just, you don't just throw out words, because if you just toss out words, that just goes back to the, you know, to that timeless expression that words are dumb, um, you know, especially when they're not applied correctly. So. <laughs> are just dumb. Um, okay, so that's kind of the that's kind of the foundation of what we're of what we're talking about, dealing with the the text of the Bible from a literary standpoint, understanding that before it could become a spiritual document to us, it has to be a literary document. So we have to treat it just as it is as a piece of ancient text, and we derive our meaning from that. Otherwise, we end up putting our meaning into it when we take what we want to believe about God and we put it into the text, what is that called? Exegesis. Exactly. Yeah. Notice I, you know, surreptitiously put that up on the board, just wondering if anyone was actually going to grab that one. Yeah, I, uh, exegesis, if you think about it, to excise something is to remove. So in, an exegesis is to remove the meaning from the text. So we're digging it out. Eisegesis is to place in. So we're reading meaning into the text rather, or letting, rather than letting the text speak to us. And that's, that's a challenge today, folks. It really is. Um, we have so much information out there and so many competing ideas. It's very easy for us to fall into an eisegetical pattern because we see someone who may have success in that. A good example is the, wealth and, uh, the health and wealth doctrine. Name it and claim it. Jesus wants you to be wealthy. Really? Paul was poor. 
Jesus didn't have, you know, didn't carry around money with him. So if Jesus wasn't rich while he was walking on the earth, how can I claim that he wants me to be rich? Does he want me to be healthy and have what I need? Of course. But does that mean that just because I'm a Christian it's going to happen? Of course not. That's just silly. You know, we have to do this thing called effort. We talked about it on Sunday. You know, so there's this. But, but if you were just to take that idea, that, that name it and claim it doctrine, and start applying it miscellaneously throughout Scripture, you end up with some really weird stuff. You end up in the Appalachian Mountains dancing around with snakes and drinking cyanide. You know, that's just kind of the way that ends up working. And by the way, those churches exist. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think 10 years ago, I read an article that the founder of the Appalachian Snake Dancing Church died from a snake bite during a service. Well, he obviously wasn't right with God. Yeah, you know, <laughs> must have been doing something wrong the night before, you know. It's just, it's, it's just like that's what ends up happening, you know. Um, and it's sad, but that's what, that's what improper application. I mean, this, this guy really thought what he was doing was honoring God. Um, there's a problem with that. That, that. That's an issue, you know. So that's the foundation of what we're doing. So one of the readings that I gave you that we uh, you should have looked at last week was how we got our Bible. So we're going to kind of switch gears and move on to that. Uh, so we're not going to be spending a ton of time in that tonight. There's only a few things I want to point out. Because most of what we're dealing, you're, you're reading in there is for your own benefit. Okay, so as you were reading through it, is there anything in that particular document that stuck out to you? Sure. Of anything. Okay, but then it seemed like over here it said they found it on the papyrus and the. Well, that's still not the original then. Oh uh, well. Uh, <laughs> that that that's more that's more dancing around on dancing around terminology. the The fact of the matter is we have no for, we have none of the actual handwritten documents of any piece of scripture anywhere. Okay. What we have are the oldest ones that we know of that we'd call originals okay. or things that, that other ones are based off of, you know. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, you, well, there's, there's, there's some there, but the question is, is that, was that the first one ever made? Because technically that's the original. Everything else is a copy, you know. Okay. So if you're... Right, but now if you were to if you were to if you were to say um, uh, if you were to say I found an original Greek Old Testament. No. No. Now you can technically find one of the original Greek Old Testaments, but it's not the original Old Testament because that didn't that language didn't exist at that time. So this is what I mean by dancing around language, dancing around terms. So when we talk about the original, people say, you know what? I want, and, and uh, please don't, no, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make anyone mad, because I, I prefer the King James Bible because it was, it, it was translated from the original documents. Well, no, it wasn't. It was translated by the oldest ones they had <coughs> at the time, which were mostly Greek and Latin. By the way, the two languages that didn't exist when most of the Bible was, was written. So are, are they original? No. Are they really old and reliable? Yeah. Uh, but that's, and, and that's okay. You know, but that's where people, in, when we kind of dance around, well, that's just not, gee, I don't know. You know, it's like saying I have the original copy of Star Wars. I uh, know you have a copy of the original release. You don't have the original copy. You know, it just doesn't, it, you're, we're just dancing around terms okay. at that time. Um, anyone else have anything stand out to them? <coughs> yeah, the uh, early testimony, the New Testament books, how people, when they were writing letters, they would refer to the letters, but mm-hmm. it's the original text. So, yeah. Peggy pointed that out a little bit uh, um, a while ago. Earlier on in the first century, a lot of the other apostles were referring to some of the other apostolic writings as scripture, you know, which was pretty cool when you, when you think about it, especially when you think about the calling of Paul. Um, it would be hard not to look at anything he wrote as, as scripture. You know, uh, when, when, if you think about it, when Jesus ascended, he came back one more time to get Paul involved. 
that's pretty cool. You know, when, when Jesus has decided to come back and appear to you, um, yeah, you got, a, you got a pretty important call, you know. Uh, but um, one of the other things that Peggy was actually talking about was, were they intending to write it? Were they intending for their writings to be scripture? My personal feeling is no, um, but that doesn't mean it did not become. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat. Um, now imagine uh, some of the early prophets, Isaiah, Samuel, writing their histories and, and stuff. Um, kind of the same thing. Documenting these things because it will be useful for teaching, for correction, for the strengthening of the body. So it would be useful in times, in times ahead. Um, making sure that people knew what God was doing with his people at this time. It was very, it was very important. And uh, uh, it's, a cool, it's a cool addition to the, uh, to the New Testament. Um, now, who, um, when you got to Eusebius and Constantine, that little, that little section, um, when you're talking about putting the Bible together, uh, did you catch the part where the Bible that Eusebius put together is essentially the Bible we have now? Essentially. Uh, now, I want you to think about this just for a second. The assembly of our Bible is due largely to the chief religious advisor to a Roman emperor. What? Um, it kind of makes you go, now, wait a second here. Wasn't, shouldn't, there, shouldn't there have been some like massive religious movement involved in this thing? You know, uh, How did it get there? How did, how, how did we get to this, to this thing? I mean, how did Eusebius figure out what books to put in there? Yeah. It's actually in the pages. It is in those pages. Yeah. Close. There's a tiny reference to the study that he did of the books that have been accepted by the whole church. Well, it wasn't technically canonized until much later. Um, exactly. So what he did is he found, the, he found the places where essentially everyone agreed. These are scripture. Uh, and, uh, and stayed with essentially what you consider the safe documents. Now, here's a couple of questions. Does the process of how we got our Bible speak more to a haphazard, carelessly assembled document that is morally good at best, but probably can't be definitively uh, determined to be the word of God? Or does it speak to the hand of God guiding the process of the Bible slowly over time through careful preservation and unity within the church? That's a very long question. Mm -hmm. What's that? Depends on if you're a Christian or an atheist. Yes. Exactly. Now, I asked Samantha this question earlier. When you look at all the stuff that you see in this, in this section... We're Christians. We believe in the hand of the Holy Spirit. We believe that God preserved his text for the benefit of all mankind. We believe all of that stuff. Why do we need to know these details? We have the Bible. Exactly. The people who don't believe. Yeah. It, the, the details of how we got our Bible aren't a ton of benefit to us. No, go ahead. Remember last week I told you that as we start this study, it will be rocking a little bit. The longer we're in it, the, you'll actually find a safer place because it's a lot harder to knock you off a rock you're attached to. Okay. You know? So when you, when you really get into... Now remember, the, 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 the section I gave you of how we got our Bible is a cliff note version of this. Very broad, broad reaching. When you really get into the detailed study, what you find is that the scripture 
was preserved so carefully by so many people across such a wide territory, it would be impossible for us to, book to for, for anyone to really look at it and believe that this book just fell together. There, there's, there's too many pieces that, are, that have been kept together. Now, think about this. When the, when, um, the last time the, the Israelites were brought into captivity, most of the scripture was destroyed. The priests knew that this would happen, so they committed the entirety of the Old Testament to memory. Sections of it. And then when they, then when they got back together, it was, it was written back down. You, you want to talk about extreme care put in this, the way God handled this over the generations, keeping it together. And the other really neat part to this is that you have a book, you have 66 books written over a time span of around 2,000 years by multiple different authors, and they all agree. They all say the same thing all the way through, as long as we approach it correctly. So when you start looking at Scripture, this is why I, I tell people all the time, you can't just stay in the New Testament. It's, you're, you're incompletely reading the Bible. You're, you're leaving so much of it out because the New Testament is simply application. The truth and the actual speaking of the Word of God is typically found in the Old Testament. When you look at what Paul is doing in his letters, what Peter is doing, what, what, what these, uh, all, all these letters to the churches, what they're talking about is the proper application of our faith. There's nothing new in those, in those sections of Scripture. It's just an easier way to look at it. Um, Mike used to say it like this, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So what we didn't know before, we know now, and now we can apply it correctly, you know, and in, in, in a much, much, broad, much more broad-reaching application. So when we start looking at the way God preserved his word, it would be really difficult for someone to just, well, you know what, this is just, this is just ridiculous, uh, you might be able to argue some of the authorship. You might even be able to argue some of the points, but you can't argue the hand of God in the assembly of this book. It, it just doesn't happen. You, you can't get this kept in such pristine detail over this length of time without the hand of God being involved in it. I mean, even if you th- just think about the Dark Ages, the only, bo- only Bible that you had was the King James. Well, and actually it wasn't even the King James at the time. Uh, it was just uh, different Latin versions of it. Um, and it was only readable by the priests. And some people look at that and go, that's just, that's just terrible. You've got six, 700 years of this horrible catastrophe we call the Dark Ages. But one of the things that the priesthood did during that time is they kept a really tight handle on the authority of Scripture. It was, it was maintained for that entire length of time. And this time where, if you think about it, you get this, these horrible things going on, could have easily just been corrupted, but it was actually preserved. And we have, we have generations and centuries and centuries of evidence of how well this was kept, uh, just specifically for us. And we can compare the New Testament documents to the Old Testament, centuries apart. They tell, they tell the exact same story. Uh, and talk about the exact same character and the exact same nature of God. So from a literary standpoint, it can seem difficult, but we're not just looking at it from a literary standpoint, are we? We're, we're looking at it from a literary and a historical standpoint and a spiritual standpoint. The hand of God is all over this book, uh, which is, to me, very cool, you know? But we need to keep keep looking at what this, uh, as we keep going, this is going to make a lot more sense. Um, well, you understand what I mean. So, um, one, of the conti- one of the consistent arguments is the Bible was just tossed together by a bunch of goat herders in the, you know, in the 15th or 16th century. You guys, don't, you guys don't agree, it's just ridiculous. But if we know how this Bible came into being, and the slow, careful consideration in each of the books, we can take that argument when someone says, you know what, this, you know, I don't know, you got the Catholic Bible, you got the Protestant Bible, you got this Bible, you got that Bible, it's just ridiculous. Now, hold on. Keith actually touched on this last week. It's not the places where different expressions of our faith want to lean on certain things as, as major truths. It's the places where we all agree. 
that make the difference. It's the authority of, it's the authority of Christ. It's in, the or, it's, in the or, it's in the origin of the creation. It's in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the absolute morality of God. It's in the promise of eternal life. All of that is where we, we, we absolutely agree. Why do we agree? Because it's in there. And no, you can't argue that. The only thing that they're arguing is style and application. Things that honestly change throughout history and throughout time. They don't really matter. At least not in an eternal spiritual sense anyway. Um, okay, so... Should we as Christians be more concerned about the style of the Bible we read or the manner in which we, pro- we approach the text? Is it more important for you to have a certain translation or is it more important to you to understand how to approach whatever translation happens to be sitting in front of you? Yep. Here's something we learned in culinary school. While I was going through culinary school, we never dealt with recipes. You may have been given a recipe, but it was it was a it was more of a guideline than a rule. You know, it just wasn't it wasn't you weren't asked to stick with that. What you wanted to learn, well, yeah. What what you do? Uh, uh, th- this is the difference between a chef and a cook. A, a chef will uh, a cook might know how. A chef will know why. So when you're what, we're, what you learn are ingredients. You learn how the ingredients work, how they develop together, how they combine, why you don't put certain things together, why certain things work, why certain things don't, temperatures, times. That's, that's what you do. And that way, when you, you get something put down in front of you, you just know how to approach it. Well, I know what this is. I know what the texture is. I know, I know what I can do with this. So that's, that's the difference. That, and as, as Christians and as people who want to adequately study the Bible, we need to be approaching the Bible in the same way. The genres in, in Scripture, the narratives, the poetry, the uh, his, uh, different forms of history, uh, the, the prophecies. We need to know how to approach these things so that when we start talking about application, we're applying them correctly. We're not just trying to apply prophecy like it's narrative history. It doesn't work. It actually causes problems. You know? um, we're not trying to apply uh, the, the, the same type of understanding uh, of, of pro- of, uh, in the opposite direction. You, know? you can't look at poetry and treat it like prophecy. That doesn't work. It, it creates cults. <laughs> Has many times, you know. Um, and, you know, we don't need any more cults. I have one I'm starting in a while, but it's, that's a whole different story. <laughs> Just haven't worked through all the pieces yet. Um, okay, so, as we continue on through this, this is, these are some of the things that we need to be looking at and focusing on. So, 1 Corinthians. I told you if we're going to move pretty quick. Tonight, because I don't want to, uh, I want to get into some certain co- uh, conversations. Okay, so in First Corinthians, what issues? Remember, we talked last week. I asked you to be looking for issues that would be uh, affecting the Corinthian church. What issues, other than competing religions, have we discovered that would influence the reading of the text? What issues in in Corinth, what, we're go- what was going on in Corinth, other than religious issues, would influence the reading of our text? Educational issues, people with different mm-hmm. levels of education and understanding. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an across-the-board universal standard. You're always going to have smarties and not-so-smarties. <laughs> um, Specific things like things are happening in the church that we have to address? Nope. Nothing to go there, what Nope. Language, history, society, historical distance. So, think, and this is this is this is us going back to learning how to ask the right questions. What is it that we're looking for? In the reading that I gave you, in the in the introductions for both those commentaries, there were a number of things pointed out that influence the reading of our text. Things that that would be in, that would be affecting the Corinthian church um, that we need to be aware of as we're reading. Uh, that was one of the, the things that the Greeks liked. Would be like because of the physical location of Corinth, you had various. What kind of city was it? It's a port city. And not just a single port city. 
it spanned the entire the uh, the entire uh, isthmus. Yes. Yeah, um, so it technically had ports on both sides. Instead of people sailing all the way around, they would sail up to it, which I think this is absolutely crazy. Put all of the take their stuff off of the boat, put it on wagons, drag it to the yeah. other side of the of the isthmus, put it on another boat because that was way easier than selling sailing the boat on the water. You know. All the way around that, 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 that uh, uh, all the way around Greece. Um, yeah, so it was a port city. Okay, so, yeah, so let's, let's, let's stop right there. What are the issues that come with being a port city? Okay. Uh, yep. Multiple uh, cultures. Languages. There's points of view interpretation. Mm-hmm. Different religions are going to come on with it. We're going to deal with religion later. Um, money was kind of, you know, most of the time it was silver. It's just a matter of whose face happened to be stamped on it, stamped on it at the time. Um, yep. Um, yeah, so lots of trade. Right? During this particular time period, something to think about. There were certain spices that you couldn't get around the world, but you could find them at a port city, and they were considered very luxurious. Certain fabrics, different types of animals that you could see, things that we just take for granted, you know? So port cities like this would attract a certain type of people. Wealthy. It was rather hobsnobbery. <laughs> okay? It was very wealthy. Okay, let's get mean. What are some of the negative things that come with a city filled of wealthy snobs? Various types of entertainment. Yep. Yeah. Material, entertainment. We're going to deal with that in a minute, and that was that. Yeah, that that's a level that we don't even understand today. Um, what are some of the other things that came with wealthy people in the first century? Slavery. 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 Acceptable slavery, even in the church. What are some other things? Could you read the three that you have underneath trade, especially the four words there? Wealthy, material, entertainment, slavery. Powerful influence. Mm -hmm. Corinth ended up being the capital of, the, uh, of that particular Roman region. So there were major politicians in that particular area. Um, center of power. Okay, when you have a capital city in a, in a uh, 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 place like the Roman Empire, it was one of three basic capitals. There was Rome, Alexandria, and Corinth. So you had government officials there. When you have major government players in a city like this, what are things that are naturally going to follow it? How did Rome rule? <laughs> Military. Military presence. Now, in this particular time, military presence wasn't just a base. The military never camped inside the city. They always camped outside the city. The last thing you ever wanted to see in the first century in that time was military entering the city armored. Bad things were about to happen. But because of where they were, you have a strong military presence at a, at a two-coast port city. What you have are military people going in and out. The constant transfer of military goods, the constant transfer of soldiers. So it made for a really good missionary outpost. 
because you could get soldiers saved and the Roman government would pay to send them around the world. This was just, this was just good thinking, right? Paul was no dummy, okay? He did this in a number of different places. Colossus was another place. Ephesus was another place, places with strong military presence where the government would send, would send their missionaries around the world for them. Um, there's a reason why the gospel went from, from just uh, uh, the Judean area all the way up and expanded through the entire Roman Empire in just a few hundred years. It was because of the soldiers, you know? It's a good, it's a good deal, okay? So these are just some of the basic social, political historical issues that we're, that we're going to be facing the church. Because when you have this type of mix of people, kind of anything goes, you know? Okay, so let's switch gears. What were some of the religious issues that they were dealing with at that particular time? Just in Corinth alone. Okay, you got to be a little more specific. Yes? Uh, okay, so um, what was yours? Uh, actually, it was uh, Temple Diana is Ephesus. We're going to get to that. I gave you that for another reason. A Temple of Aphrodite is essentially the same thing, slightly different, different, uh, different goddess, but the the worship was almost identical. So, in these big cities, you had token gods and goddesses. Anyone know who the token god of the port city of Corinth was? The port city. What's that? Poseidon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Who wouldn't want the god of the sea guarding them, right? So the token goddess was Aphrodite. I am not going to spell that right, so whatever. So <laughs> what about other pagan temple influences in the area? What? You would be called upon next. No. Uh, what about other pagan go- uh, goddesses, gods and goddesses and temples in the area? How many, anyone remember how many temples there were in, in Corinth? Almost 40. Yeah. Um, there's still there's some debate as to the, the final number, but it was in the high 30s. Um, people like the, t- the, goddess, uh, the temple to Isis. Uh, what were some of the other ones? Mithria. Um, they, were, they, were just, they were just all over the place. Uh, yeah, there's just, just lots and lots of them. But here's, here's, here's some of the issues. Most of the temple worship was matriarchal. Okay? Everyone understand what that means? Yes. They were the ones that typically... It's, it's women's fault. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Well, this was a whole different type of work, you know? Uh, yeah. So... Um, in these temples, a temple priestess had another role. It's a temple prostitute. That's how you served your God. And, the, and Aphrodite is a goddess of passion, love, lust, immorality. One of the main focuses in the worship of Aphrodite and most of the other temples that were there was the pursuit of physical pleasure um, in ways hard to describe, okay? Now, it's, archaeologically, it can be verified that temple prostitution did not take place at the altar of Aphrodite, okay? Didn't take place at the altar. What would happen... Um, what would happen is basically around the temple and in other, other buildings, there would be stalls, not much different than cattle stalls, set up not much different than cattle stalls. Be hay on the ground, there'd be a sign above the person or the lady inside letting the guy who's walking, whoever, well, the guy, girl, or whoever, who happened to be walking down that hallway know what their speciality was. Way beyond brothel. Yeah, Um, because this was worship. Okay? How would that play into the 
the issues that Paul would be facing in the establishment of the Corinthian church. I am asking that question. Definition of worship would be very distorted by they got the faith and norm, so the mm-hmm. idea of worshiping God would be very different yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. It also explains why he downplayed the role of women in the church. Uh, both here and in Ephesus. Yeah. But not in his other writings. You know, it's one of the one of the one of the big troubling things about some of Paul's writings, talking about First Timothy dealing with, with Ephesus, talking about Corinth. He's like super, super strict and hard on women in both of these both these areas, but nowhere else in any of his other writings. It's actually very free in most of his other writings, uh, to the point where women are actually named among uh, uh, apostles uh, in some of his other writings. I mean, you're thinking, what, this is, is, what kind of a contradiction is this? It's actually not a contradiction when you understand that the letters to the churches were specific to deal with issues. They weren't just general letters. Hey, everybody, I want to share some thoughts with you about uh, uh, ladies. You need to be nicer to your husband. That's not the way he's dealing. He's trying to deal with specific issues because the future of the church is at stake. So when, when you're talking about the amount of religious tension that exists in the city, the amount of historical and societal tension that exists in the city, it should help us understand why Paul was so strict in his application of our faith and in rules and in conduct in society. He gave like no wiggle room. Immoral brother, get him out of the church. I mean, how many of us when you think, well, you know, we need to apply the New Testament modern days. Really? So um, if I catch your son or daughter making out at the arcade, I'm supposed to bring them before the church and have them thrown out of the building because they're immoral. Do you see how that's not, that's not going to work today? Generally speaking, the church wouldn't last very long, you know? So, but there's, there's a purpose behind his standards. And unless we understand what he's combating, we'll never understand the purpose behind the standards. They just seem overbearing and troublesome. So when people come at you, look at some of the stuff that's in the Bible. That's just ridiculous. No one lives like that. That's just, that's controlling, that's manipulative, that's that's legalism, that's ridiculous. Er, Hit the brakes. Hold on. Do you understand the society and some of the issues that they're dealing with at this particular point in time? Well, why does that make any difference? Well, it makes a huge amount of difference. Let me explain it to you. Now you walk people through the thinking behind the thought... (laughs) so they can understand what the actual application is talking about. So you're walking them through an exegesis so that you can get to the hermeneutic so they can understand what God is actually talking about. Most of the time, when you hear Paul talking about women, all he's saying is, Christian women, you shouldn't look like whores. (laughs) If you were to line up temple priestesses and Christian women, there should be a marked difference between the two in both dress and attitude and, and the way we conduct ourselves and our family, it should be obvious that, that we are going in a different direction with our lives. That's predominantly what Paul is talking about. So, but if we can't cut through the questions, we'll never get to the truth. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, 7.55. All right. Here's what we're going to do. What's that? What do you think I was going to say? (laughs) 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 Sorry, I was a couple minutes late. (laughs) (laughs) Cool, works for me. Um, So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We're going to come back at 10 after 8. And what we're going to do is we're going to go table by table. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And you guys are going to tell me what you are seeing and what questions you have in regard to the content of what we're looking at, okay, based on what we're talking about. We're only going to do that for a few minutes, and we're going to take a real quick look through our, through apo- through our apologetics procedure, and then we'll wrap up for the night. Cool? Cool.
Okay. All right, everybody, why don't we find our seats? We'll get back to this. So all of you people who don't like to talk, you're about to... Okay, good night. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Come on, Connie. No, no, wait. That is really trouble, Connie. <laughs> 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 okay, is there a table who would like to volunteer to go first? All right, folks. Okay, hold on. So, so let's make sure that we are in chapter two of First Corinthians. All right, so this is what's going to happen. I'm going to read, and you're going to tell me to stop when you're ready for me to stop. When we come to a place that where, where you go, okay, what about this? Uh, and then I want you to explain to me why we're stopping there. Okay? Stop. You agreed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just stop now. It's fine. Is this to our table, really? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Just, just their table? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's at, at the moment. And then, uh, and then at some point, I'm just going to stop, and we're going to move on to the next. Okay? All right. So... When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Okay. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I try to be as helpful as I possibly can be. <laughs> I read in the NIV. Uh, NIV 1984 version. Yep. Like, he doesn't want to come in like he's all, like, mm-hmm. older than now. He wants to meet them. Eloquent, like eloquence or, or, or big-sounding words. Yeah. He wants to yes. meet them where they're at so that he can talk to them on their level. Mm-hmm. 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 Why does that matter? So maybe it's a, a showing how there's a lack of education there or something. Mm-hmm. So we're talking because about the Greeks are always after wisdom. Like, they're always trying to be people don't be philosophically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, whatever. Well, He's setting up what he's about to say more, because there's more to it. He's asking about the wisdom of God, not of men. So he's, he's setting them up for that. Yes. He's introducing. He's, he's also reminding them of things, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did he say to them? Well, we're going we're to come to you here. In, in, oh, don't, don't offer anything you may need later. <laughs> yes. Yes, this is, a, this is a letter read out loud to the church. Yep. Okay. Now, remember what we were in, in chapter one. What was, what was the main thrust in chapter one? Unity within the church. Because? Mm-hmm. What were some of the things they were saying? I'm of, I'm of, I'm of, right? Yeah, and we likened that today to denominationalism, right? How, well, I don't, I'm not, I don't believe that Pentecostal nonsense because I'm a Southern Baptist. Right? Well, and it's kind of like the Greeks were like, well, I follow Aristotle. No, I follow Plato. No, I follow whoever Right, Aristotle. yeah, so in the Christian circles, what, what about that argument is significant to where Paul is right Paul is, at that time, an issue that he may be trying to deal with right there. Like what Keith said last week about focusing on the actual deity of Christ? Yes. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. One message. Singular. Not Paul's gospel or Peter's gospel, or Apollos' gospel, mm-hmm. one gospel. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I came to you in weakness, in, um, in weakness and in fear with much trembling. 
My message and my preaching were not, uh, not with wise, persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest uh, on men's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age. Or oh. Ru- oh, okay. Sorry. No, 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 that's exactly what I want you to do. Yeah. So when I read that part, it makes me think about how we were just talking about there was a division between prostitutes and priestesses. What did you call them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, you're, you're talking to a more mature audience is what, you, what, you're, what you're trying to say. That there's, yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a level that we're trying to get to. Right, and those mm-hmm. that know and can hear and see a spirit and those that can't. Yes. The division of those two. Yep. Some people are going to get it. Some people ain't. Yep. Okay, so. Uh, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, that God destined for our glory before, the time, before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no eye has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Notice there's a question mark at the end of that. <laughs> So he's actually wanting them to think about that and, and give a response to that. Now, and I have a question mm-hmm. about what well, we were just talking about that quote from Isaiah. If they were Greek, they wouldn't have had the Torah, they wouldn't have known. Like, why would he be quoting something they wouldn't have any idea about? Or so, were there some Jewish Christians there with him uh-huh. as well? You tell me. I, was it the Corinthian, like, the church in Corinth or Corinth in general was mostly Greeks, or I mean, it was a there wasn't a lot of Jews, right? Mm-hmm. There wasn't much. There wasn't a ton, okay. but there but there was a temple there. But there was a synagogue there. Okay. So the leadership of the church would have been um, converted Jews. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't have just been uh, local people. It would have been people that Paul would have known. When he picks elders, if you notice, if you see the way he picks elders when he travels, he tends to go to the synagogue first and convert as many people there as he possibly can. And then all of a sudden you find out he's picking leaders, like maybe a year or so down the road. It would make a lot more sense, and historically this has been proven to be accurate, that he would be grabbing those learned people in, in the Torah and the Old Testament to be leading and teaching the rest of God's people there. So even though this is primarily a Greek city, it's actually the most populated Greek city uh, at the time, the leadership of the church knows what they should know. So it's a, it's a totally valid, valid question, and it's a really good, it's a really good uh, uh, a way to address this particular thing. But um, Paul's pattern is to use slightly more educated people to become, to be the first leaders uh, within the church. So we can rest uh, on the idea that they would have known what this was. There's another thing behind this. Um, When you see a reference like this, okay, what is something that we should be able to assume? Paul just referenced an Old Testament scripture. What is something that we should be able to assume? Uh, yep, that's one thing. We, they're more likely within the synagogue. They're definitely a copy. Um, it was, Paul was addressing them in context of the original passage of what was in the synagogue. Yes. Um, let me put it to you a different way. When you get to the end of the school year and you're taking the final and the, and the teacher puts the, the final down in front of you, what is something that the teacher should be able to assume? You because it's been taught to you. Mm-hmm. So it should, it's basically, he's, he's, we can assume that Paul didn't just build the church in Corinth and then take off. He spent, he spent time there. Because we, we, we already know he spent a year in Antioch, right? Remember we talked, I think we talked about that a while ago. Um, so we can assume that, the, these, that he has gone through this and he's addressing something that they should be familiar with. You know, he, he, it's, it's like saying, we talked about this 
you know? It's like when you catch your kids doing something, you know, that they, they already know that they shouldn't be doing. And even just looking at them, they already know that they were told not to do this. It's that same thing. This is, we, we should be able to assume that Paul is using a piece of scripture that he has already taught them. Okay? So this wouldn't be totally new to them. They wouldn't be going, oh, we should probably read that book. They've, they've already got it. Okay, they've already got that information. Um, so there's a piece of information that we should already have. Okay, so, uh, but God has revealed to us by his spirit, so I'm going to keep going. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except a man, uh, except a man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, uh, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, excuse me, um, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths um, in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept things that comes from the Spirit of God. Uh, it just seems like he, he understands the Spirit, you know, as it's, it's opposed to the flesh. Mm-hmm. When you, uh, you mentioned before how it's within the man's spirit, he's trying to emphasize that you have a spirit mm-hmm. inside you. Mm-hmm. It's not just the flesh, and we need to connect the Spirit of God and to see these truths. Yep. As Christians, why is this a big deal for us? Because Jesus Christ left this Holy Spirit for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to be um, well led by. I, makes me, what comes to my mind is that we all have a unified understanding, so there's not a you know, sometimes when we're not talking about spiritual things, somebody may understand it in a, in a different way than if we all are in the spirit, we all understand have a unified understanding. Mm-hmm. So, but if it, if it was apologetics, like if we're talking to someone with a different worldview, they're not going to understand it whatsoever because they don't have the spirit in them. So we could say whatever and be like, Mm-hmm. There's no way that means that. Which is basically what Paul just said. Right. Okay, so, as a Christian, what do you do right there? Spirit this, spirit that, like you guys have some magic voice inside of you telling you what to do. That's called insanity. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a little stab at, I think it was yeah. a Joy Behar, I think it was. Yeah. 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 We just said that the, the Holy Spirit should be able to reveal the truths of Mm-hmm. Yep. So, as an atheist, what's the big deal about spirit? You know, if 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 God's a spirit, why doesn't He just talk to me? Because he has a relationship with Him. Yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized what you're doing. Okay. Just trust in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Just trust in Jesus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Someone turn, over to John, someone turn over to John chapter 3 and tell me as an atheist why I'm supposed to care about this whole spirit thing. Okay. Hey, I don't know if I missed something. I'm not John chapter 3, but the spirit. The spirit doesn't. It's there, but you've got to ask the spirit into you. You've got to welcome it. You've got to accept uh-huh. it. It's just. Uh, but if it's just saying, okay, I'll, I'll listen to the spirit. Okay. Okay. That makes me that makes sense to me as a Christian, but what is the difference between me saying I'm willing to listen to the spirit and a Christian saying you need to you need to have the spirit in you? See as as an atheist, I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, Jesus said uh, that you cannot he said that uh, you know the seed of the kingdom must be born again. Aha. Okay, there's a key right there. We must be born again of the Spirit. Okay. So, the phrase, you must be born again of the Spirit. Keep going. It says what? Mm-hmm. Uh, first of water and then of Spirit. Okay. So, we know immediately we're talking about two very different things. First, you must be alive. Okay, right? And then next you must be reborn. 
now I have some place I can take someone. You see, here, no, it's just the spirit of a man, the spirit of God, and the spirit and spirit, spirit. What is the big deal about the spirit? Now I have a journey that I can take someone on. You understand what I'm saying? I can, I can grab someone. Okay, so let me explain to you what being born of the spirit means. Being born of the spirit, being reborn means that I, as a human, am born disconnected from God. If I go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, we were born, the spirit of God was given to us. In sin, that spirit died. We were promised that, that spirit would be made, made new in us through some path that God was going to prepare. He spent all of this time giving us the law, giving us the understanding, giving us prophecy, telling us when Jesus was going to arrive, Jesus came on scene right on cue to die for our sins so that the spirit could be reborn and we could be reconnected with God. That's the rebirth of the spirit. It's kind of like if you don't have a phone in your house, you can't get a call. <coughs> So when we are reborn of the Spirit, we are reconnected with this living Spirit of God. We can understand things and receive things that someone who doesn't have that, that spiritual connection is just simply never going to be able to get because they have not been reborn of the Spirit. Cliff Notes version, obviously. But, but you see how just that section, constantly leaning back on the Spirit, like Eddie was saying, prompts an entirely different conversation. So if someone is arguing with me, talking about the spiritual connection thing, it's just a bunch of nonsense. I have plenty of places I can go. I can jump all over the place as long as I'm coming back to what is the big deal about the spirit. Now, as a Christian, I should also re realize that I do have the spirit of God. So what is the implication there? I can know the mind of God. As a Christian, yeah, now, now think about this. As a Christian, I have no excuse for not hearing and understanding the word of God because I have a connection between me and God. The only connection that apparently matters, right? Because I can read this book all I want. Without the spirit of God, I'll never understand it. Okay? Let's finish this section up. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. Ta-da! Because they are spiritually discerned. The, spirit, the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind, uh, mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Okay. Connect. Chapter 1 to chapter 2. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways Paul is defending uh, <clears throat> the division they made in his teaching. Because if we say mm -hmm. that, um, that they were divided over stylistic differences, um, then he's saying you don't really get a handle on my style because it didn't come to you with logical arguments. I came to you with a very simple message of... Uh, Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's that mil military expression. If it's not broke, fix it till it is. Find, do everything you can to find something to argue about so that you can divide. Paul didn't have that. What did he say? One gospel. Did not come to you with big, massive arguments. Came to you with a single gospel. Jesus and him crucified. Okay? So now, connect that to what we were just talking about. Give you a really big hint. It's at the last verse of chapter 2. One gospel, one mind. No reason. Basically what he's saying is there's no reason for Christians to be divided <coughs> on the simplicity of the gospel, the relationship within the church. We have one purpose and we should we should be coming together behind that you know stop arguing over style stop arguing over these details that they don't make any difference come back together as a church because you have work to do now we're talking about pulling everyone back to a single line of thinking and to a single line of purpose within our exegesis 
Why does that, uh, how does this play into our understanding of that? So it's that unity is in opposition to, to all this diversity. Yes. And different ideas, it's, it needs to come together under the uh, authority of God, the one God, yep. and the one teacher. Yep. Is Paul saying that there cannot be uh, particular styles of worship? Favorites, people who favor one style or expression of faith over another. Is he saying that that can't happen? Absolutely not. You see it in other areas uh, of, of his own writings. He actually embraces it. But in this case, they are up against so much, they cannot afford to be particular. They cannot afford, the gospel in Corinth cannot afford to have multiple expressions. The more opposition you have against you, the more the church should be unified in a single message. Wouldn't it be interesting that in, if in the most urban areas within our own country, the multiple denominations would figure this out? In rural settings, like where we are, you can have all kinds of expressions of your faith. No one cares. In an urban setting like New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, there, are, there is so much going against you that it's too easy for people who don't want anything to do with the church to find a reason to stay out of the church because the church isn't unified. Well, at least that's what it appears on the surface. Imagine if the churches in a place like Los Angeles decided, you know what, one message, that's it. No denominational nonsense, none of this stuff we're going to do. We're going to preach one thing and one thing only. I bet stuff would change, you know, but that's, that's uh, uh, easier said than done, so to speak, I guess. So there's a brief exegesis of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, okay? Next week, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You have in your possession, if you got the, the paperwork back there, a full commentary from, from Tyndale's on 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so go back through, take a look, and the the idea is remember this is a letter, so it's not multiple miscellaneous floating little arguments. This is one argument for a, for the church to come together for certain. He he touches on different things, but it's one conversation. Okay, so use your commentary as you're reading through. Do exactly what we just did. Read, and when you find something, you go, wait a second, what's that? Stop. Go to the commentary. Take a look at it. See if you need to read back or read forward or jump somewhere else. Do the work you need to do. And then when we come back next week, we're going to do the exact same thing, uh, starting right off with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And actually, we'll do 3 and 4. Sound good? So, uh, so here's what we'll do with this. Chapter 3, chapter 4. Okay? Um, and just to make it interesting, <laughs> for chapter 3... You're the Christians. You're atheists. For chapter 4, you're the Christians. You're atheists. So, that'll be the second hour. Okay? So, when you find your points, as you're looking, you might also be looking at what someone may have a problem with outside the church within that section. Yeah. Are you doing this whole side? Both of you. Just Both tables. You pointed it. Yes. You are chapter four, but you're the Christians in chapter four. You're the atheists in chapter three. You guys are the Christians in chapter three. You're the atheists in chapter four. Okay? Yeah, everyone loves playing the atheists, right? That's just a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'll ref. <laughs> Uh, that's up to you. That's not up to me. You know? um, yeah. Okay, so in our remaining time here, I want to go through a little bit of our, uh, well, I don't know if I have time to actually do it any kind of justice, but I'm going to, uh, we'll walk through a little bit of the apologetics process here um, as we're kind of, as we're talking 
You're going to see me as we start to do this, uh, this beautiful arguing part. One, when we start really getting into the apologetics part, we haven't really started touching on this. You've seen me do it a little bit, kind of playing the devil's advocate, talking about how I don't know, you know, um, taking the atheist standpoint every now and then. Um, we're going to be coming back to a really fundamental understanding of apologetics. Apologetics is simply the process of reasoning, okay? It comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give an answer. To give an answer. So apologetics, by definition, literally, is to give an answer. Not to <laughs> just trust in Jesus. Uh, you know, which is, like I said, which is great, but at the same time, it is not an answer. An answer is an answer. And sometimes, honestly, the answer is, I don't know, but I will find out for you. That's acceptable. That's totally acceptable. You know, even the most hardcore atheists, well, they'll respect that because we're not trying to just make something up sound smart at the time. Um, we'll leave that to them. But when you come to uh, most arguments dealing with Scripture, dealing with uh, um, uh, the process of our faith, they're going to come down to four basic questions, okay? Can anyone tell me what those questions are? Yes. Meaning, morality, and destiny? Origin. Someone took the apologetics course. (laughs) Origin. Where did I come from? Meaning. Oops. Basically, does my life have purpose? (laughs) Morality? Plainly, how do I know the difference between right and wrong? destiny. What happens when I die? These four questions are what make up someone's worldview. Okay? When you talk about arguments of religion, arguments of theology, it is almost always going to come down to world view. Okay? You can argue the material to a certain point. But to most atheists, to most agnostics, the material is arbitrary. It's really not that much not that big of a deal. Most atheists, honestly, you can give them the answer all day long. They don't care. They just simply don't want to believe. And the reason that they don't want to believe is because of their, the answers that they've already given to these four questions. And believe it or not, question number one is the key to the entire thing. Uh, because if th- there's, there's only two, when you talk about origins, um, and I think this will probably be where we end tonight. Uh, when you talk about origin, where did I come from? It's the whole reason why I got into the creation ministry. There are only two answers, it, and it's not, uh, and believe it or not, it's not evolution or creation. It comes down to this. Chance, intent. I probably did not spell that correctly, but that's okay. Yeah, it's either chance or intent. You are either really highly, uh, really complicated pond scum, Okay, you're, like, you're, just, you're just hearing it from chance. Random chance. No meaning, no purpose, uh, no, no, real, um, uh, uh, no real purpose behind us being here. We are either a cosmic accident or we're the result of intent. We're the result of a creator. We're the result of, some, of, 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 uh, of, of a mind, of a desire. So if there's intent behind our being, then naturally we have a purpose. 
because our creator would have a purpose for us. If you're just, just random chance, then there is no purpose to life because there can't be. The only purpose, when you're talking about a, a, a random chance universe, the only purpose life could possibly have is whatever you decide. So, what, so literally, whatever makes you happy is, is a go. As long as you don't get caught, it doesn't matter. But if we're the product of a creator, that has repercussions, doesn't it? That means that there might be someone we're accountable to. That we may have a set of rules. We may have to answer for our life. There may be maybe a set of standards that we actually have to get to. And almost every conversation I have with an atheist or an agnostic comes down to question number one. They hate that question because there's no good answer outside of in the beginning God created if you, even if you find someone who's very scientifically educated, and I love arguing with these people because they have good peripheral arguments that cannot track back to a single central argu- argument. They don't have that foundational understanding. So everything, it's very easy to unravel it. It's actually fun in some cases. But when you come back to origin, everything unfolds very, almost too neatly, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, it's when you think about the mind of God and the way our bodies are built, the amount of communication that just happens within a cell. You know, it, it's, un, it's, it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> uh, how complicated our bodies are and how complicated this world is and this universe is, how delicately balanced it is. So when we come back to that, that fundamental question of where did I come from? I almost always end up back at that conversation. We end up going through purpose. We end up going through morality. We end up going through destiny. um, But it always comes back to, I do not want to believe that I'm a product of a creator. I want to believe that I am random chance because if I believe that, anything goes. Uh First five words of the Bible are pretty specific. In the beginning, God created. Hard to get away from that one, right? So as Christians, if an atheist can trap you in that spot, and unfortunately a lot of Christians are in this this place, uh, and it's really just because they haven't studied it enough or haven't been taught enough um, on how to refute those arguments, they go, well, I'm a Christian, but I believe in evolution. (sighs) Your entire argument is now gone. When people say, well, you know, here's, here's, here's the good one. It's called theistic evolution. It's the most prominent argument uh, for evolution with, within the church, and, and it's one that's uh, unfortunately very, very easy to, to destroy. In the beginning, God created, but God created through the process of evolution. What are the natural assumptions in that statement? Anyone? What's that? Someone's confused? No. Nope. Yeah, the idea of evolution is things change over time. But when, if someone says God used evolution, it means he can't make something ever is not enough. God's not all powerful. But God, if, if, if God made evolution, then God is God. If God, if he can do anything. Well, that depends, you know, because if, if God had to use the process of evolution slowly over billions of years, then he's obviously not all powerful. He's probably just a highly evolved being. What's that? He left it up to chance. Or maybe guided it. That's some of the thinking. But no matter how you approach it, outside of an all-powerful creator God bringing us into, in, into being, you have an impotent God who is not all-powerful, who is not all-capable, and does not control all things because he's still subject to the laws of nature, time, energy, uh, space. He, he's still subject to the physical world. That's not God. In order for God to be all-powerful, omniscient, all-seeing, and, and outside of space, time, and, uh, and energy, he cannot be bound by any of that. So therefore, the idea that God spoke it into existence has to be exactly what happened, or God is just a really old alien. That rots, yeah. I think you, I think you need to expound on that, how um, 
the concept of God using evolution to create the world subjects him to the rules of time and space. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if God, could, if God was limited to being able to manipulate the physical world, then he is not outside of the physical world. He's simply doing nothing bigger than what scientists would be doing today. Learning, understanding, and then manipulating. But you have to be able to, um, you know, what's the, what's the old joke? The scientists de- declared a, uh, a challenge to God. We figured out how to make life, so we are going to, we're going to challenge you to make life. So scientists and God got together. They said, we're going to take this dirt, and God said, ah, get your own dirt. <laughs> okay? You have to be, in order to be omnipresent, omniscient, all-knowing, you have to be outside of the constraints of space, time, and energy. Space is the place we occupy, okay? Time is just simply how long this space has been in existence from its, from its inception to its end. And energy is, the very, is everything that makes it, makes it work. I mean, believe it or not, when we click the lights on, we're actually creating energy. But, well, I gotta, I gotta say that correctly. We're not creating energy. We are, we are, we are manipulating energy atoms into a different form of energy. You, energy cannot be, con- be destroyed or created. It's just not the way that works. So we're, we're just transferring it into another, into another process. If God was limited by that, then that means he is also within the confines of space, time, and energy. That's not God. You, you cannot claim to control all of it and still be limited to what's inside of it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. 